good. How are you? Not bad at all. Right, we're going to be working down on the edge again, but more over towards the south. So, aber dieses Mal machen wir es nicht in einer Reihe, sondern wir machen es in Zickzack. Ja, 45 Grad. Immer eine. So What's eine the effect so when you mix different trees like that? Well, because every tree brings their own microorganisms. That's enough. Bring the microorganisms and uh, their own um, insects, uh, etc. And they. Um, and therefore you don't get, uh, in monoculture you always get pests because they bring their own insects and then you have too many of the one thing. And that's the reason why you then get, have to start with herbicides and pesticides. And um, I'm going towards the end of my life now, I guess. Uh, I'm now 77, although one sire told me I was going to be 127, but I don't quite believe that. Anyway, what I feel is that I'm trying to get something really worthwhile going. So I've taken over this, these um, eight hectares. Uh, very, it's very bad soil. It's considered no use soil by most of, of the uh, farmers around. And the only way they get over it is to use more slurry and more uh, chemistry. I think actually most of our sicknesses nowadays are just purely because our food is so poor. It's not only the fast food, I mean that makes it even worse still, but it's the just the poor quality of food because of the poor quality of the soil. So that was the first thing we decided that we were going to find a way to work on this type of soil and we uh, I hit on Terra Preta when I was in Brazil in 1996 and I've been doing experiments with it in between time. And then I met Roland Wolf who, uh, and Roland uh, was also into it, so we decided this was the way we were going to go, try and get something a bit better than compost going in the, um, in the sandy soil. It's sand for, eight to 15 meters down. So it's not only sandy soil from the point of view of um, um, not too much nourishment, but it's sandy soil also from the point of view of losing the water. So you just lose the water completely. So you were asking beforehand, what's all this mulch about? Well, that's one of the main things uh, with mulch. Using mulch and covering the earth and not having any open earth means that when the rain comes, you make full, full use of it. We've had uh, mulched fruit tree trees still having moisture on their roots after 16 weeks of drought. And this is one of the ways we're going to save the earth. And that's what, what the Australians were talking about when they started this idea of permaculture to Australians in Tasmania. Why am I doing all this? Well, I'm doing it just purely because I really enjoy um, planting. I really enjoy seeing the plants coming. And I really enjoy designing with plants. Designing areas like we have done here, this big sun trap, or designing areas like the one in front of you here, which is, uh, will be a circle afterwards a circle of quite high trees and within it we will have then fruit trees. Um, so you have to sort of think ahead to envisage this thing 15 years down the line. And then you can uh, get the feel of what this place is going to look like. Okay, um, there is a project less than half kilometer outside here, which Margaret and I did 24 years ago. And it's been taken over by the Zen group and they're going on ahead with us. So you get the idea of what 
this is going to be like 20 years down the line. So that's our motivation. And that gets all the people going. They go out and have a look at this, and then they say, aha, that's the way it could be. You see? Yeah, and you see things like this awful looking lump of rubble there. And why the hell would you take something like that into a green field? Well, what's happened is by putting all these fields together and having these huge fields nowadays, there is no habitat for a lot of things like uh, weasels and uh, uh, things like uh, salamander and you know all, all sorts of our, our creepy crawlies uh, that are that need a house, need a, some sort of a nook. Yeah, even the uh, the porcupine, uh, the hedgehog needs a whole lot of twigs and just a pile of twigs. So we have piles of twigs there and over there. You can't because that's the whole idea of permaculture, is that uh, every element has mere functions, and every function is um, answered by more elements. So you get uh, a stability and you get a, a whole uh, variety within the area. And this is what... I've, I've got the wish to transform matter into fertile soil. And uh, I do this by fermenting um, organic mat uh, matter into, into soil adding um, charcoal and um, some woody material and um, stone powder and then fresh green cut and manure basically. Um, our ancestors have been using um, urine and feces. This of course uh, I can't do at the moment but the best fertile soil actually I'm convinced relies on feces, uh, on uh, human feces. And that's what our um, destination is to bring our own matter back uh, into the soil. That's what every animal does, uh, what all the, the plants do. They recycle everything and transform it into soil. And what we've been doing for the last few centuries is um, to gasify matter and um, trans transform the, the mother that feeds us uh, into uh, yeah, uh, gas or, or male spirit. And um, that's, I, I feel that that's one of the big problems we, we are running into, that uh, we dissolve um, the matter we, we live on, we get our food from. And that's what um, actually the plants do for us. They pump carbon out of the atmosphere and then by producing charcoal I put it into the soil and uh, it stays there for centuries if everything goes well. Um, my conviction is that um, the, the, the plagues actually developed when we started mixing feces with uh, water and urine and um, people started to use old wells as uh, toilets and then drinking from the well beside uh, that was polluted by, uh, by this uh, well used as a toilet. Um, and then they started blaming uh, other people like, like the Jews and uh, killed them because they thought the Jews had poisoned uh, um, the drinking water. Um, before that, actually, um, people used their feces and their urine as, um, as a fertilizer. And uh, in order not to get sick, they transformed it uh, via uh, composting or fermentation into a soil fauna. And um, so the, um, the microbes from our intestines were transformed into soil microbes which uh, actually uh, formed a very fertile uh, gardening earth. And um, yeah, and nowadays we are not ready anymore to, uh, to take care of our own feces and to make sure that uh, something healthy develops out of it. Um, because of this experience with um, the plagues in the Middle Ages when people lost the knowledge how to um, to make soil out of it and uh, mix it with water which actually uh, um, costs did cost a lot of uh, human lives and this is in my uh, opinion still is the reason why we are we are so alarmed about our feces and why it is such a taboo uh, topic uh, we what 
all we want at the moment is a flush toilet um, that uh, yeah uh, let's let's us get rid of uh, all the worries about uh, shit but uh, i think it's our responsibility to take care of it personally again okay then yeah genau genau also also bald wie möglich We're doing a quick um, black soil or terra preta bed. Um, we don't have all the ingredients, um, so we, um, we, we, we lack a fresh green cut. Um, kitchen garbage we're gonna fetch later. Uh, but what we're gonna do now is um, put some straw and wood chips uh, um, as uh, an underlayer, and uh, then put the, uh, the horse manure on top of it, and then mix it with charcoal and, um, and um, clay powder. Um, and then cover it with, um, yeah, with a bit wood chip straw and uh, soil. And uh, in the beginning it gets up um, over 50 degrees, but within two days or three days it gets down to 30, 35, 38, and that's what that's the temperature we want to have for living beings. Uh, we, we, we're going to plant uh, berry uh, um, shrubs into it. Or, um, Anything. It's just it will stay there. It will be used next year. Mm -hmm. Do the berries absorb the manure, the bacteria? Um, well, the thing is that we um, we wait till the uh, soil microbes have absorbed uh, the, the nitrogen and the um, and the uh, microbes that are in the manure, so that the um, that the berries can use healthy soil as they do in nature. Uh, it, it's a change of uh, of microbes. Thin layer of straw at the base. Very weak. How wide do you want to do it? Hmm? How wide do you want to do it? Ich denke, die, die Breite hier von dem Beet, oder? My name is Elisa Graf, and um, I came to Lebensgarten because um, I had been living in community in the United States 
so I came to visit in uh, January of 2009, uh, just after the economic crisis began. And my husband and I talked about coming to live in Europe with our kids because he's German for many years, and it just never was the right time. But after the economic crisis, and we realized that the right, we could see the writing on the wall that now was the time to maybe start looking at alternatives because um, Lebensgarten is really closer to an eco village than a co housing community in the United States is. Um, in terms of the fact that um, they're really experimenting with alternatives um, and sustainability in a way that a lot of um, a lot of people in the United States are not yet aware even about, even if they're progressive people. And, uh, so we've been living here for about a year now, and we really love it. And Lebensgarten is a wonderful place. Um, yeah, from the permaculture, I love the fact that it has its own farm, and I support the farmer Jean Philippe. Um, by getting a box every week, which I did in the United States, and it's so nice I can walk to my farm um, and I can help on the farm. And uh, I love the fact that um, that we have a seminar center at Lebensgarten where people are coming from all over to learn about things like permaculture and uh, meditation and um, uh, nonviolent communication and things of that nature. So it's it's a very progressive place, and I, I just think that when time when the time comes where people really wake up to the fact that we have to change, and I think it's happening, they're going to need models, and this is the place where you can find that. So I'm very proud to be a part of it. It's about how we are connected. Everybody, every one of us is connected to this, I don't know how to call it, this criticism of capitalism. We are connected to this Wall Street, Occupy, Frankfurt, everything, and it's our own our inner feeling, how we connect, how we are conscious about how we behave in daily life is when we go for a supermarket, we want the cheapest stuff that is possible for us to get. We are already feeding this energy, this energy of maybe exploiting this planet. And then we support this energy. And I think if we start with ourselves, how we are get conscious, how we behave, how we create the world, we feed all these banker stories and all this capitalism. And if we don't support this system, we don't give energy to all this system. But we have to start with ourselves. That's it in my point of view. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I am Kirsten, I'm from Denmark, and I'm here to do a workshop with my very good friend Gerhard. Gerhard and I, we have met in Budapest many years ago, and we immediately like each other, like to work together, and we've been doing that. I think we are in our eighth year and our workshop number 20 or something, or more, workshop number 30. Some of them take place here in Lebensgarten, again and again. What kind of workshop is it? We are doing workshops in nonviolent communication. I think it affects the people here, and not only the people here, I think it affects all of us who are connected in this world. I, I share this belief that the past is with us, and we can learn to live with it. We can learn from it, and we can create a better future which is, for me, the main point, that we can create a better future, we can learn. Maybe we can learn that killing other people is leaving a pain not only in those who are killed and the relatives, but it's also leaving a pain in the person who did the killing. Because I need to do something inhumane to myself to be able to kill another person. And maybe we can learn from that and find another way of dealing with our differences. So when we disagree about something, that we find a peaceful way of seeing each other as human beings and finding a solution that is good for both of us. Yeah, I, I, first of all, I would take a time for myself to really connect with me. And then when I meet you, with, your, with what you say, then I would start to say, so, for you, it is very important to stand up for these values like freedom and and humanity, and you really want to go for it. And you, this mean, means a lot for you. Is it like that? This is the only way I know. If somebody is having a strong attitude to something, that I start in in recognizing and, and acknowledging what is the humanness behind it, what are the needs behind it. When I see the human in this being and really let it be without wanting to change it immediately, I think this is the only way, the other way, or one of the best ways I know, the other one may, may start to open his ears and his heart. And when I try to convince him that he's wrong or that there's something wrong with what he says, he will not listen. So I want to listen to him first, not because I think it's less what I have to say, but I want to talk to open ears and an open heart. And I take the time to really connect to this human, human being first, before I say something else. And I, I have a lot of very good experiences in that, and a, very, a lot of very bad experience in trying to convince people by arguments and discussions. really would like to be able to do is to share what it means for me instead of sharing the ideology. So I can speak about the, the 11th of September in this way. Hey, what about wonder what the world would be like if it was not the way it's explained? I'm just thinking about it. I don't know what happened, but I hear these explanations and they don't make sense for me wonder what the world would like if, it, if there was another answer. And I'm curious, will you explore it with me? So it's an invitation to be wondering together, instead of me claiming that I know how it is. But I'm only learning this now. I'm not an expert. I danced from the age of five. And our, we, every Friday, we had dancing for the children in the afternoon and for the grown-ups in the evening. And of course, because it was in our house, then I did both. <laughs> so I just danced whenever I could. Then I began a uh, competitive dance and went in for wheels and jigs and whatnot. I've got, even got gold medals for dancing and whatnot. And then when rock and roll came in, I immediately got going with rock and roll. Now, this is the first time rock and roll came in, <laughs> not the second time. Right. And the first time, so Bill Haley and the whole thing, uh, Within three months, I was doing um, performances of rock and roll at different events, even at circuses and whatnot. You know, firing 
my partner around between my legs and over my head and all sorts of things like this. What you would now say that we would see the break dancers doing, you know, with that sort of... Uh, my parents were warned by all sorts of people I was into something that was really bad news. Um, dance is a great way of relaxing and getting the right and left brain going together. You have to coordinate your whole body with this music that's coming. And um, you have to get a flow going. So you get into a completely different mindset than when you're thinking up something or when you're in action, doing something. So it's, it's a balance. But it's also the flow of life. And here is where I'm trying also to bring flow into agriculture and, and to bring uh, symbiotic systems. And that, of course, comes through dance as well. Oh! 